Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, the first book of the New Testament. Not first book written, of course, that was by James, the book of James. But Matthew's our first lead-off book in the, the Gospels uh, here. And uh, we're looking at Matthew's account. Remember, Matthew was a publican. He was a dog, as far as the Jewish people were concerned. The lowest thing on the planet was a tax collector. Even the Jews didn't like him. And uh, they were their own people. And so, but he got saved. And when you get saved, you get changed. And his life changed then and now and for eternity. Changed so much that he became an apostle. Changed so much that God allowed him to write the book of Matthew. And so we praise the Lord for that. And it's a long chapter, I think 26 or 28 chapters in the book of Matthew. Yeah, 28 chapters. But we're in Matthew chapter 16 tonight, finishing up, Lord willing, we'll see if we can, on a transplant, having a change of heart. And tonight we're going to look at a change of ownership. A change of ownership. You know, the, the, our, our brother Peter says over in Peter that we've all been purchased or redeemed, not by uh, gold or silver or precious stones, but by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our brother Paul reminds us that we're not our own. We are bought with a price. Therefore, we should glorify God in our bodies. Amen? So we're not our own. In other words, so we don't own ourselves anymore. We have a new owner. We have a new master. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, I have to obey my master. I have to do what my master wants to have since there's been a change in ownership. See, it's, it's not me anymore. I'm not the one that's supposed to be running the show and running my life and calling the shots, making the decisions. That's up to the Lord Jesus Christ because he's my new owner. He's my boss. We're slaves, the Bible says. And some of us become bond slaves, as Carol and I have in our life, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, let's draw together here and let's read it. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, say, that's me. See, are you a disciple? Okay, so then this would apply to us today. Okay. If any man. So now we see if any man. So any, anybody. So this applies to anyone who's eligible and, and for this. Will come after me. That's the first thing. That's an open invitation. For anyone to come after Jesus, open invitation. Let him deny himself, number two. Number three, take up his cross, number four, and follow me. For whosoever, there's again, anyone, will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus gives us an open invitation to come. He tells us we're to deny ourselves. We're to take up our cross, and then we're to follow Him, total surrender. And that's given to all of that. So we're going to look at that. Father, thank You for tonight. Bless our time in Your Word. May Your Holy Spirit be our teacher and our guide now. Bring to remembrance all the things that Jesus has said to us. Uh, speak the truth to us as You always do. Give us illumination, Lord, understanding of the Scripture and speak to our hearts and help us to understand that this is the authority. This is God's word. It is the final authority. And we as believers have a responsibility to obey it. And Lord, we have not only to be hearers, but we're to be doers of it as well. So help us, Holy Spirit, tonight to do so. Help your servant now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Jesus asked a question over in the Sermon on the Mount as he was beginning to close out his Sermon on the Mount, he asked them, but who do you say that I am? You remember that? He's asking the disciples now after that long sermon, all day sermon. I got to keep reminding you all of that because one day we want to do that. <laughs> Bring your box lunch and all that good stuff. And he says, who do men say that I am? Who do you say? Notice he asked the question, who do you say that I am? Now notice, and it came to pass when Jesus had entered, ended these sayings, this is the end of the Matthew of his Sermon on the Mount, the people were astonished at his doctrine, that's his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. So when Jesus asked the question to them, who do you say that I am, notice their first response. 
Number one, the response of the disciples was what other people say rather than what they say. See, when Jesus asks something of you and I, he expects you and I to answer. Not for someone else, but for ourselves. He's asking us the question tonight. Who do you say that I am? Well, the people say, uh, the other church down here says, you know, this group over here says, no. He said, I'm asking you, who do you say that I am? And so the response of the disciples was what other people say rather than what they said. And so look what he says in Matthew 16, 14. We're in chapter 16. We're going to be looking at some verses here. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Now he's asked them, who do they say? And they already started off here. Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say Elias. Some say Jeremiah. That's Elijah the prophet. That's Jeremiah the prophet. Or, hey, you're one of the prophets. But in verse 15, we find Jesus didn't want to know what the other people were saying. He wanted to know, what are you saying? And folks, tonight Jesus doesn't want to know what everyone else says. He wants to know what you say tonight. He wants to know what I say tonight, you see. Jesus didn't want to know what the other people were saying, but rather, what are my disciples saying? Are you a disciple tonight? Remember, and he said unto his disciples. So Jesus is talking to us tonight through his word, the word of God, and he wants to know what are we going to say, not what someone else is saying. And he said unto them, in verse 15, But whom say ye that I am? Well, our brother Peter finally jumps to the gun. He's always getting the jump start. He's the big choleric fisherman and the loudest mouth. But that's okay. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now everybody would think, well, that's wonderful. That's fantastic. But look at verse 17. Peter's response came from God speaking through him. It didn't come from Peter. It came from God speaking through Peter. Because look what Jesus said in verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed or blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Why? For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now what did he confess? He made a bold statement very quickly and spontaneous action that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's why Jesus said flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you, but only my Father through my Father did. Because you see, a lost man cannot do that. A lost person cannot do that. A lost person cannot say that. Did you know that? You ever talk to people? That's why they said, well, some of them say you're Elijah. You see, that's the lost crowd. Some of them say you're the prophet Jeremiah. Some of you say you're another prophet. Others say that you're a a, a good teacher. Uh, You're a good rabbi. You're a good master. You're a good man. You're a good carpenter. Oh, here comes the miracle worker. See, that's what the crowd in the world can say because if you've talked to enough people, witnessed to enough people, you'll never hear as a rule, as a general rule, the lost will never be able to say that because, you see, the only way you can say that is you have to have the Spirit of God in you. I'll show you that. Turn to 1 John with me. Go to 1 John chapter 4. You have there. Go to 1 John all the way to the back of your Bible. 1 John chapter 4. Everybody in 1 John chapter 4? All right, let's everybody get to 1 John chapter 4. Let's see if the pastor is right. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 15. All right. And it's, uh, John's talking about testing the spirits and see which spirit's right, whether it's a false spirit or the spirit of Christ. All right, the Holy Spirit. And in 1 John chapter 4, in verse number 15, Whosoever, are you with me? Whosoever shall confess. That Jesus is the Son of God, what's the answer? God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Are you with me? Turn over to chapter 5 and verse 10, maybe on the same page in your Bible. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, and he that believeth not hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. 
See, someone you have to believe on the Son of God, and you have, notice what it says, you have the witness within you. See, you've got to have that witness within you in order to identify who Jesus is tonight. Are, are you getting quiet in here? You see, only because Jesus said, Peter, the only way you were able to do that was through the Spirit of God. And 1 John 4, 15 makes it clear that the only person that confessed that is one who possesses the Spirit of God. So just something there to throw in for you tonight, all right? So we have, number one, the response. Number two, rather. Number three, quick. Number three, Peter's response was quick and direct. And he answered. And then number four there, Peter's response came from God speaking through him. You see, and that's how you and I confess that Jesus is the Son of God. It's because the Spirit of God speaks through us. Because we have the Spirit of God in us. You know, you don't hear a whole lot of people confessing that. Because they can't. Apart from knowing Christ and having the Holy Spirit in you, because it's the Holy Spirit that reveals to you who Jesus really is. See, he's not just a carpenter. He's not just a man. He's just not a good teacher, a good rabbi, a good prophet, a miracle worker. No, he is the Son of God. And only those that are saved and born again can say that, because it's the Spirit of God that causes you to say that. All right, so we come back to there. Let's look at number five here. But who do you say Jesus is? Now, this is to you. Who do you say Jesus is? Well, I gave you some things that you ought to be able to say. Here's what you and I ought to say. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is the good shepherd. He is the true vine. He is the door. He is the resurrection and the life. Those are the very claims that Jesus made of himself in John's gospel because he is the Son of God. And you and I ought to be able to confess that. How many times have you heard the crowd in the lost world out there say these things? See, they can't because they don't know him. They can't because they don't have the Spirit of God living within them, and He's the only one that can enlighten you and, and, and cause you to say, now, now, I know there are some people out there, they have the right answers, and they know what to say. But that doesn't make them born again. And they'll struggle with this. Okay, very much so. All right, Jesus knew what was ahead. How many of you think Jesus knows what's ahead tonight? Huh, do you think this coronavirus caught Him offhand and, and off guard? No, do you think He knew about this? Well, certainly he did. He knows everything. Amen. Okay? He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnowing. He's all powerful. He knows everything. He knows ahead for tomorrow. He knows what's down the road. He knows the big picture. We don't, church. Amen. Okay? We don't. Jesus knew what was ahead. Now, when you're reading this and you finish the Sermon on the Mount, and, and here's what happens now. Once Jesus finds out who the people say that he is, once he finds out who Peter revealed who he was, and, you see, and it was interesting that the Spirit of God revealed that to Peter so Peter could make that confession and that announcement in front of all the other disciples. See, you ought to be telling people who Jesus is in front of everybody else. Look what it says in verse 21 now. We drop down in Matthew 21, 16, 21. From that time forth, then, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So how many believe Jesus knew what was ahead? Now, how many think Jesus knows what's ahead in our life tonight? Remember... A change of ownership. Okay, that's the title tonight. A change of ownership. It has to come from a change of heart. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm not the boss. He is the boss. That's what we speak of, the Lordship of Christ. He is the Lord and Master. You see, He owns me. He bought me as a slave. He redeemed me. So I don't own George, I'm not my boss anymore. So let's see, since Jesus knows what's ahead, Peter, and now here's what Peter did, but watch this. Peter, if you read uh, go, uh, Matthew 15, 8, if you read ahead, Peter, Jesus knew what was ahead. Peter actually began to uh, reprimand Jesus. 
How many of you have reprimanded Jesus? Oh, but you have. Many times. I'm going to show you. He began to reprimand Jesus. You know why? Because how often do we think we know better than God? Well, we know more than God does. We hear His Word. We hear what it says. We read what it says. We shout amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And when we say amen, that means that's right. You're agreeing that that's right. You're agreeing that that's the truth. But then, something happens. We really don't, we think we really do know more than God. You know why? Because we go out and do what we want to. See, our actions speak louder than our words. See, God tells us, and, and we know what the Scripture says, and we even agree to it. But then we go do what we want to do. See, we, what we do, we do what Peter does. We actually reprimand the Lord. See, this is what His Word says, but I, I know that's what His Word says, but I'm going to do this. I know what His Word says, but I'm going to go do this, or I'm going to go here. I know what His Word says, and I agree with it, but I, 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 you know, this is the way I think it ought to be done. This is how I think I ought to handle it, because I know more. I know better. I know more than God. Isn't that what we do? And if we don't say it, folks, we do it with our actions, because I see it all the time. I see it in the lives of believers constantly. We sit and we listen to God's Word and what God's Word says, and we agree with but then we turn right around and we go out and do whatever, however, whenever we want to. Or God tells us a certain way how we should handle something, and we go, I know that, I, I say amen, I agree, but you know, I'm going to handle it this way. I'm going to do it my way. That's just saying I know better than God. That's like Peter. No way, you know. This is not going to happen. God, I'm not going to let this happen. You know, Peter, Peter was something. Else. Matter of fact, he even rebuked the Lord. Hey, and, and we do the same thing. Look at Peter. Look at verse 22 of chapter 16. If you don't think so. Now, uh, turn to Luke 22, 42. Since you're there, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Gave you a couple other scriptures. Didn't write them down for you. Look at Luke 6, uh, 22, 42. Everybody in Luke 20, uh, 22, 42? All right, everybody there? Say amen. Luke 22 and verse 42. Is that right? Okay, let me make sure I got the right place here. All right, now, now we're talking about Jesus knows the head. He knows the big picture. And he just got through telling them from that point on, the scripture said, he began telling them that he was going to go and be turned over to Jerusalem and to the men's and the scribes and the Pharisees and all that. They were going to take and kill him. And he was going to die. He was going to be buried, but he was going to rise again the third day. And Peter rebuked that. Matter of fact, it said so. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. In verse 22 of chapter 16, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not happen, or this shall not be unto you. Can you believe that? But what did Jesus say? Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done, because see, God owned Jesus. You see, it's his will to be done, not my will. It's his way to be done, not my way. It's his plan, not my plan. Because, see, I don't own me anymore. I have a new boss. I have a new master. Uh, look at, uh, look at uh, James, James 4. Turn over to James with me. Go all the way back to James. Take your place there in Matthew. Turn over to James. Get back there, in the, back towards the back of the New Testament. After Hebrews, you'll have 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. And then you're going to have Hebrews. And then you're going to have the book of James. And we're going to look in James chapter 4. Everybody in James chapter 4. All right, in James chapter 4, uh, let's see what our brother James tells us to do and handle here. All right, in James chapter 4, beginning with thir verse 13. Everybody there looking and reading with me? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow. See, we think we know today and tomorrow, but Jesus knows what's ahead. We will go into this such a city, and we'll continue their year, and we'll buy and sell and get gain. No, we're going to go and do our thing. Whereas you know not what shall be on tomorrow. See, you don't know what's ahead, but God does. 
For what is your life? It is even a vapor that peereth for a little while, and then it vanisheth away. In other words, it's here and gone tomorrow. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. How many of us live that way? You see, but Jesus taught us to do the Father's will and to ask for His will, not our will. But yet we go about the whole thing. So what's going on here, you've got to understand that the devil has entered into Peter and influencing him, and he's trying to tempt Christ. All right? Jesus immediately, we're back to number two there in your outlines real good. Jesus immediately recognized where this temptation, temptation was coming from, and he dismissed it. He was purposeful and intent on not failing for distractions. Peter was trying to distract him, rebuking him, reprimanding him, telling him, hey, man, this is not going to happen, brother. I'll see to it that it won't, because I'm Peter. Matter of fact, in a little bit of while from now, we're going to get into the Lord's Supper, and I'm going to even make a bigger statement than that. I'm going to die for you. I don't know what these other guys are going to do, but you can count on me, God. I'm going to die for you. And he said, Peter, I tell you what, you've opened your mouth up once too much. You always put your big foot in your big foot in your big mouth. I'm telling you, before the rooster crows tonight three times, th- crows, you are going to deny me three times. But he turned. Now look at this. We're in still Matthew chapter 16 now. We're down in verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God but those that are of men. Whoa. Are you getting this? But he turned and said unto Peter, Okay, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest. That word savorest means setting one's mind to something. Peter, you're putting your mind on the things of men rather than on the things of God. Are you with me? And not the things that be of God, but those that are of men. And then let me tell you what Isaiah 55, 8 says. You write this down. Put that verse down. Okay, so we're talking about this. Because remember, the whole thing is that Jesus knew what was ahead. He knew what was coming. And he's telling them, and Peter's rebuking him, reprimanding him, telling him that's not going to happen, that's not going to be. Who are we to question God and to tell God what to do, when, and how to do it? We're not. But we do. Now, see, we may not say it like Peter, but we do it with our actions. We know what God's Word says, we've learned it, we've memorized it, we've studied it, we've heard it preached on it, and we go right out that week and turn right around and do just the opposite of what God's Word says. So you know what we've done? We've rebuked the Word, we've rebuked the Lord, we've reprimanded Him, because after all, we know more than God. God tells us how to handle something, and we're going to do it our way. Well, I know it says that, but I don't agree with that. I'm going to do what I want to do and how I want to do it. Hey, go ahead. In Isaiah 55, 8, if you wrote the verse down, here's what it says. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. There you go, right? That ought to be good enough right there. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So see, whatever you and I are thinking, just throw it around because it's not his plan. It's not his thoughts and his ways because he just said so. Well, I don't agree with that. Then you just rebuked and reprimanded God because, again, you're saying, well, I know more than God does. Because my way, my thoughts, my idea, my plan is better than his. Well, I'm just telling you what the scripture says tonight. Amen? Oh, good, two of you. Now you're going to be careful about saying amen. Because you see, when you say amen, that means that you say, I agree with that. You're saying, so be it. That's the truth. That's right. Well, be careful, because when we do, then we're accountable. Okay, I just want to make sure. So now you all are going to just be saying, praise the Lord and preach it. Now, when I do this from now on, you're not going to say anything. You're going to say, oh, me instead of amy. All right, amen. Come on, smile. I love you. 
I don't get up here and preach like this for the fun of it. I have to preach to myself first. I have to remind myself first that I catch myself in these things if I'm not careful. We all do. So I'm just trying to help us. Save us a lot of heartache, a lot of scars and regrets and everything else. And we just would listen to God and follow God because He does know what's best. And He knows more than we do. And when you think, and when I think, and I'm guilty of this, when we think we got it all figured out, put it on the table because you ain't got it. Because He just said, your thoughts, boy, are not my thoughts. And your ways are not my ways. Do we understand each other? Yes, sir. And by the way, my thoughts are higher than yours. And my ways are higher than yours. Because why? Because the heavens are far above the earth. And you live on the earth, and I live in glory. And there's a big difference. Woo! Amen. All right, let's move on. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. The word strange there means unusual. Don't think anything unusual of this trial which is there. And the trial is a temptation, which is to try you as though some unusual strange things happen to you. 1 Peter 4.12. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, uh, but is such as common unto man. See, temptation is common to all of us. Even when it comes to God's way and my way. Even when it comes to God's thoughts and my thoughts, okay? Remember, these were temptations because of the Lord, uh, Peter, was, thought he was doing a good thing. I'll die for you. I'll fight for you. I'll pull out my sword and take on the whole Roman Legion army that's coming after you tonight in the garden. No, you're not. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows in the morning, Peter. You see, because, see, Peter's thoughts weren't God's thoughts. Peter's way with the sword was not God's way. God's way, he had to go to the cross. But Peter was going to try to stop that because he knows better. Lord, this is never going to happen. May this never be. And what, isn't that what we tell God all the time? Boy, this was, this was good studying this and looking at it. I said, whoa, oh my goodness, Lord, I'll never get through this in 20 or 30 minutes. Okay? My goodness. All right, but with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. All right. All right, so when we face temptation, number three there, and we face temptation to doubt, to fear, to worry, or to fall for the traps of the enemies, remember God has another viewpoint. See, the devil, the enemy comes in all sizes, shapes, and forms. Temptation comes in all sizes, shapes, and forms. And he's going to do whatever to tell you. You're going to do this, go here, plan this, and all this. When God has already said this or that and that, we got to decide whether we're going to do it his way and follow his way or our way. And there's going to be those times of temptation and all that's going to arise. And we've got to come to a place as to who we're going to obey and who we're going to follow. Because you see, if I've had a change of heart, then I've got a change of ownership. Because I'm not my own. All right. See there. Jesus called us to, cha to a change in ownership. Now here we go. All right. So we got a little work there, a little background done and so forth. Jesus called us to a change in ownership. Number one, to be a follower of Jesus. Isn't that what he said? He that come and ask, any man that come out come unto me is going to have to take up his cross and follow me to a disciple. So to be a follower, how many of you want to be a follower of Jesus tonight? You can say amen or don't say anything. All right, because whatever we agree to or say to, we're held accountable for it. To be a follower of Jesus, we must give up our own way. It's not my way or my will, Lord, but it's yours. Then Jesus said unto his disciples again, If any man will come after me, there's the invitation to you tonight. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Well, I had to say, what's that word deny me? If I'm to deny myself tonight, if I want to be a follower of Jesus, and I do, and I hope you do. It means, to with, it means withholding or abstaining from the pleasures of the world for the sake of Christ. This is what it means to follow Jesus. If you're going to deny yourself, you're going to take up your cross and deny yourself to follow Jesus. You, got to, you see, you're going to have to withhold or abstain from the pleasures of the world for the sake of Christ. Isn't that what 1 John 2, 15 and 16 said? Write that down. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. There on your verse for you. What does it say? I'll tell you what it says. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the love of the world is not of the Father, but of the world. And then he goes on with about the grass and the flower with us and go away. All right? You understand that? 
So you see, this is if you want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. All right, Jesus is okay. Deny yourself. What am I denying myself of? Abstain, withhold from the pleasures of the world. For my sake. See, we do it for Jesus' sake. Then he says, now to be a follower of Jesus, number two, we must take up our cross. Then Jesus said unto the disciples again, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. We looked at that. We'll take the next phrase. Take up his cross and follow me. Now we're going to take up our cross. We know what a cross is. A cross is a sign of shame. It's a sign of suffering. It's a sign of sacrifice. It's a sign of denial. I mean, it's a sign of a lot, man, of, of agony. Only when we have victory in Christ is it a sign of victory. Because that's our victory. But right now, it's a lot of other things to us. The word there to follow me, that was interesting. Disregard, it means to disregard, it means to lose sight of, and forget himself, that's you and I, and his own interests. All right, if I'm going to take up the cross, I have to disregard, I have to lose sight of, and forget myself and my own interest. Now, folks, we got a lot of interest, but I want to follow Christ. The word follow me, that phrase, it means to cleave steadfastly to me. That is to Jesus. It means to conform wholly to my example, Jesus is saying, in living and, if need be, in dying for me. Because, see, that's what a cross represents. Wow, so you didn't think it was so heavy to follow Jesus. See, when we go through this and look at this a little more closely, this is why you see a lot of people drop out. See, this is where they drop out because, you see, to be a disciple cost. Discipleship is costly. And most, I hate to say it, but I believe a lot of believers are not willing to pay the cost. The day in which we live in, they're not willing to pay the cost because it's just too costly for them. But I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Okay, number three. When you hang on to your life, Jesus said you're going to lose it. When you hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. We're back in verse 25, Matthew 16, okay? But then again, what did he say? When you give up your life, you save it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So see, Jesus has called us to a change in ownership. So he's telling these fellows, hey, listen, guys, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to take up your cross, and you're going to have to follow me. Now, how many times have we read that scripture? Over 100,000 times we've read it and read this passage. But you see, it isn't until we break it down and start taking some word studies to see how thick, how rich this is, and what Jesus is really saying to us. And then you see, then we've got to make a decision. Then we've got to go, wow, this is costly. I don't know if I'm willing to pay the price. And there are a lot of people who are not. Because it's costly to be a disciple. There's a price to pay for it. And there'll be those that will, and there'll be those that don't. Okay? Now, let's get down to where we live. Our lives belong to God. Well, one person tonight. It's okay if you want to say amen. amen. Our lives belong to God. Amen, church? Ephesians 4.14, that we henceforth, in other words, from now on, Paul says to the church of Ephesus, be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And boy, do we see that today. Boy, any kind of doctrine comes down the pike, and everybody goes after it, like a whirlwind or a tornado. Anything that looks good, sounds good, sounds different, sounds new, and here they go. By the slight, and notice where all of this wind of doctrine comes from. Look at the next phrase. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive you. Huh? See, that's why we have to study the Word. That's why we got to get into the Word, deep into the Word. we got to know the Word, because if not, you see, you'll go chasing after every wind and doctrine that comes down the pike. And we wonder why the church is in a mess today. 
Because we get some slick-looking guy up here, and he's handsome, tall, good-looking, wearing a three-piece Marcus Neiman suit, or now they're wearing a, a black, a shiny black leather pants and go-go boots, and got the black shirt on, the sleeves rolled up, collar turned up like Elvis, got the jerk shirt buttoned all the way down to their navel, unbuttoned, and I'm going, what in the world is going on? But oh, they're flashy, and the the, the building, the auditorium, wherever that is, jam-packed. Follow, following false teachers and false doctrine. And they'll sit there and believe anything that's said to them from this person up here. You know why? Because they don't know this Bible. And they get deceived and they don't know what to believe. Just as long as it looks good, sounds good. And if he feels like he hasn't got the crowd going, he'll do some dancing or some jigging around, or he'll bring up the keyboardist, and here go the music, and it'll get wilder and wilder, and then the congregation goes into a frenzy. And they call that worship. Well, we went through worship here not too long ago. That's far cry from worship in this Bible. I can tell you that right now. There's a time and place for all that if you want to go there, but I'm not going to go there, but that's called a disco lounge or a nightclub. That's where you go. Not in here. Amen. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. You see that? You belong to Jesus, and Jesus belongs to God. Amen? Amen. All right, we'll wrap it up. You don't have to fill in anything. All you got to do is just follow along with me. We're not even going to, all right? So we're looking at our lives belong to God. Can we all get an amen or a hallelujah, praise the Lord, whatever. Now remember, if you do, you're held accountable for it. I got quiet again. I don't do that to trick you folks. I just want to make sure you're with me. And I want to make sure the Holy Spirit's getting through. I'm not up here to hurt you. I'm here to help you. To lead you and to teach you, that's my job. I have the same responsibility Peter had as we looked at last week. Peter, do you love me? Pastor George, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. And I'm to feed you the word of God. The bread of life. Pastor George, are you sure you love me? Now, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Feed my lambs. That's little Sean. He's a lamb. And any new believer here, a young believer. One more time, Pastor George, I want to make sure we get this right. Because sometimes I'm not clear about your thoughts and your ways. Uh oh. Uh uh oh, huh? Yeah. Do you really love me with all your heart, all your mind, body, soul, and spirit? Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love you. Then, boy, feed my sheep. And you feed them the living word, the bread of life. And not what you say or anybody else says. You feed them what I say. Whether you like it or not. Now, boy, put that in your pipe. And I have to tell the Lord, Lord, I don't smoke. (laughs) Man. Let's go home really quick. All right. Number one. We're looking at our lives belong to the Lord. Thank you for helping us get through this right quick. I was hoping I was going to almost start and go pick up next week, but we lose it all when we do that. All right. If your life belongs to God, then who owns your will and your desires? Who does, all right? Now, the God of peace make you perfect, mature in every good work to do what? You see, he owns your will, not you. Because we have a change in ownership tonight. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see, that is if your life belongs to God tonight. That is if you're willing to make that change in ownership. See, you can still be saved, but you can be the owner and the boss of your life and not him. And you're going to be miserable, I'll just tell you that. Better off give the give in and wave the right flag and surrender. Amen. You know, so we're, we're talking about living for the Lord and Him being our boss and, and, and having our lives. We're not talking about salvation and being saved tonight, all right? If your life belongs to God, who owns your time and your resources? He does. What is He owns my time and my resources? 
Paul put it this way the church of Ephesus. Again, redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. The word redeem means to buy, to purchase. The time. Buy back the time while we have it. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So you see, you don't own the planet. He does. And everything in it, he owns. Including you. Hello. Hello. Okay, amen. Number three, if your life belongs to God tonight, who owns your ambitions, attitudes, and actions? God does. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Romans 12, 11. Ephesians 4, 23 again. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 1 John 2, 6. He that... He that he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. We walk with Jesus. Number four, if your life belongs to God tonight, who owns your life and all of you? He owns all of you tonight, not part of you. See, when Jesus saved you, he didn't save part of you. He saved all of you. Amen? Amen. When he forgave you of your sins, he didn't forgive you of some and not others. Oh, well, I'll be shouting hallelujah on that one, brother. Okay? When Jesus washed you with his blood, he didn't wash half of you. He washed all of you and made you whole and white as snow. When Jesus filled you with the Spirit, did he only give you part of the Spirit? Or did he give you all of the Spirit? You have all of the Spirit. You have all you ever need. The problem with most of us is does the Spirit have us under control? One God. I'm going to pause on that one. One God. You all agree with that tonight? We have but one God, one Father of all, how many fathers? One, who is above all, and through all, and since this is to Ephesus again, our southern pastor here, in you all. See, Paul was a southerner, he's from the south. Amen. But now, present tense, thus saith the Lord that created you. O Jacob, another word for Israel, and he that formed thee, O Jacob, Israel, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Now, man, it don't get any better than that, church. Wow. Again, a heart transplant, a change of heart, a change of ownership. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that enlightens us, illuminates us, give us understanding. Now, Lord, we've learned some things tonight. We may have learned some new things tonight that we haven't heard. Some things maybe we haven't really given thought to or thought about. But tonight we've heard some things. We've heard your word. Now, help us not to be hearers only, but to be doers of the word. Help us, Lord, to not my will, but thy will. Lord, help us to understand that my thoughts and my ways are not yours. Your thoughts and your ways are much higher than mine. And Lord, help us tonight to remember we're not our own. We have been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. You own us, Lord. You're our Lord and Master. We're your slaves to serve you, to love you, to do your bidding to do your witnessing, and to go about telling the world that Jesus 
is the Son of God. He is the Christ, the Anointed One. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and the King of Glory. Oh, Father, help us. And Father, help us in our thinking and doing and making our decisions that they will be your ways, your thoughts, and we will ask you. Father, we thank you tonight now in Jesus' name. And again, thank you for your precious word that has touched our hearts, enlightened us. Your word is so good, God. Thank you so much for it. And Lord, I want to thank you for telling us the truth. Oh, praise God for the truth. And Jesus said, Father, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And he says, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And if you have the Son, who is the truth, you shall be free indeed. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And God bless you tonight. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May his face shine upon you as you go from this place. Be safe. Be careful. And Lord willing, we'll see you at 1030 Memorial Day Sunday this Sunday as we pay tribute to our men and women that gave their lives for our country so we could be here tonight and do this thing right.
Every chain will break as broken hearts declare. 